Hello everyone. As mentioned in the last Walking Dead video I uploaded, I recently decided to reread all the Walking Dead comics that I own. Whilst doing so, I was surprised by how much content that can be found within the comics themselves, which has been omitted or changed for AMC's take on the popular zombie story. With that in mind, I've decided to do another video focusing on said differences, but this time I'm focusing on the changes made to the characters themselves, rather than specific story points. So, in this video I'm going to discuss 5 Walking Dead characters who I believe are better on TV, and 5 who I believe are better in the comics. As expected, this video will feature spoilers relating to both the TV show and the comic series, so please don't watch if that's going to be a problem. Anyway, without further ado, let's begin. I read the Walking Dead comics after watching the TV show first, so when I finally did get around to reading them, I was shocked to find that Shane Walsh, the antagonist for two entire seasons of the TV show, is only in the comics for a paltry six issues. When you take this into account, it's actually quite impressive that somehow the TV showrunners managed to make a guy who barely featured in the comics into someone who audiences would sit and watch for 18 episodes. I mean, you could probably read through all the comic issues that Shane featured in, in the time that it takes to watch one episode on TV. Shane never really feels like a truly developed character in the comics. One minute he's Rick's best friend, the next he's a complete psycho who screams and swears at Rick at the flip of a switch. His turn from Rick's pal to enemy feels extremely unearned and rushed, and I feel that the TV show tackled this problem in a much more effective way. On the show we gradually see Shane lose it as time goes on. We see glimpses of his evil side when he kills Otis and later threatens Dale, and as a result his transition to villain feels a lot more natural and believable. In addition, I've always found myself actually feeling quite sympathetic towards John Berthnall Shane. Yes, he was a dick, but looking back on him now after seven seasons of the show, he was actually correct regarding a lot of things. Whilst everyone else in the group was still trying to remain civil and humane, Shane knew what a shit show the world had really become, and was willing to let go of his old morals and beliefs in order to survive, something that most of the main cast would actually do themselves later down the line. Finally, I don't envy the position he was in at all. Shane went from caring for his best friend's child and sleeping with his wife, only to then have his old friend seemingly return from the dead, and then have both Carl and Laurie thrown away like a piece of trash. TV Shane is a lot more believable as a villain, but also easier to sympathise and empathise with, which makes me prefer him over the short-lived comic book version. Before reading the comics, I didn't realise what an important character Tyrese was. In the show, Tyrese arrives during the prison arc, and in my opinion, it feels like the writers never really knew what to do with him. It seems he was simply added to the mix in an attempt to appease those who were fans of his character. However, I'm not sure that this actually worked, as TV Tyrese is nothing like his comic book counterpart, and is a much worse character for it. On a TV show, he spent much of his time as a Morgan-esque type of guy someone who hated violence and wouldn't kill, whereas in the comics he spent most of his time as Rick's right-hand man and was arguably his closest friend after Shane died at the hands of Carl. His relationship with Rick was one of the highlights during his comic run, whether it was seeing them immediately hit it off when they first met, or watching them beat the crap out of each other at the prison, or finally witnessing the pair of them both be too stubborn to apologise for one another for what had happened, it always made for interesting reading when they were both in the comic panels. Seeing him die at the hand of the governor was a brutal end to a very likeable character. TV Tyrese, however, I never really cared for. In all honesty, I found him to be a bit dull. This combined with his anti-violent stance upon reflection just made him feel like a poor man's Morgan. He also featured in one of my least favourite episodes of the TV show, What Happened and What's Going On an episode where viewers were subjected to watching Tyrese sit in a room bleeding to death whilst viewing hallucinations of dead characters for about an hour. I found it to be one of the most boring instalments of The Walking Dead, and I didn't really care about Tyrese dying at all. I feel it's pertinent to discuss Herschel after Tyrese, as the bearded old geezer was the man to take on his iconic comic book death in the TV show. Herschel was never really the focal point during his time in the comics. He was a side character and means to an end. He simply existed so the survivors had somewhere to go after the Atlanta camp fell, and was often relegated to the background after his initial introduction. Like his TV show Double, he did die during the governor's final attack at the prison, but it only felt like Kirkman did so because he was an expendable member of the cast whose story arc wasn't really going anywhere. 
The genius thing about TV Herschel's portrayal is that during most of season 2 I found him to be pretty unlikable. He appears as a grumpy old man stuck in his ways, who wants to rid Rick from his farm and put all the guys and girls we are rooting for back into danger. It was a massive shock then when during the next season and a half on the show he became the heart of The Walking Dead. Herschel transformed from a miserable elderly git to a lovable grandad figure. It's hard to believe that he was once so angry and stubborn. Perhaps his greatest quality was his selflessness. He was always thinking about others rather than himself, and this was personified during the flu arc in which he risked his life to save as many people as he could. Honestly, I'm yet to meet any Walking Dead fans who don't like Herschel, and he remains one of my favourite characters on the TV show to date. I'm sure that one of the most unexpected aspects of Season 2 of The Walking Dead to comic book fans was seeing Mr. RV himself, Dale, snuff it. The reason being is that Dale is a prominent figure in the comics and doesn't die until much later at the hands of the cannibals. His classic tainted meat moment would be stolen by Bob in the TV show. Perhaps it is a bit unfair to include Dale in this list, as his time in the show was cut short, meaning we will never know if he could have equaled or eclipsed his comic book counterpart. However, as previously mentioned in my Top 10 Worst Walking Dead Characters video, I did find the TV show version to be quite annoying, especially on second viewing. Now, I'm not going to go into huge detail about TV Dale again, but I definitely do enjoy the comic book version a lot more. One of the most endearing aspects of Dale in the comics is his relationship with the younger Andrea. Like most relationships, things start out pretty well. However, as time goes on, Dale's insecurities begin to surface. The poor guy loses his leg during the prison arc, and this coupled with his age and dad bod physique causes him to question why Andrea is with him in the first place, as well as constantly look over his shoulder. This sense of jealousy that he feels does a great job of humanising his character, and I always found it kind of compelling witnessing the conversations him and Andrea had about his lack of self-worth. Whilst I could never see the pair of them getting together on a TV show, their relationship in the comics always seemed genuine, and it made for heartbreaking reading seeing Andrea tell him how sorry she was for joking about him being old and telling him how perfect he actually was after he was bitten and waiting to die. It's a shame TV viewers never got a chance to see this unfold. Morgan, like the previously mentioned Herschel, suffers from being a completely disposable side character in the comics when compared to the main character status that he currently has on the TV show. His introduction in the comics is still pretty much the same. He is still the first person Rick speaks to post-outbreak, However, unlike the TV show, Rick and his crew then don't encounter him until after the fall of the prison, when Rick decides to go back to him before setting out to Washington DC to help Eugene with his made-up quest. Morgan has a similar problem to the comic book version of Herschel in that he doesn't really do much and just exists as screen furniture. In fact, once he is reunited with Rick, in several episodes of the comic that he appears in, he doesn't even have any lines. To sum his comic narrative up, he meets Rick after he wakes from his coma, Rick then goes back to him before going to Washington, he hangs around with the group for a bit, gets bitten during the attack on Alexandria, has his arm chopped off to try and prevent the bike spreading, but still dies anyway. Yeah, it's not the greatest of story arcs, and I think I remember reading somewhere online that Kirkman himself said he didn't really know what to do with his character once he brought him back, and to be honest it really shows. Thankfully, he didn't make the same mistake twice, and since his reinduction on the show, Morgan has become one of the main players. Whether you like his all life is precious approach or not, you have to admit it's a very clever piece of character development to have a man go completely over the edge with grief, only to find a way to change and redeem himself. And whilst in one way it is nice to see Morgan at peace, it's the risk of his crazy side emerging once more that makes him engaging to watch. I loved seeing him briefly go back to his feral ways when he brutally killed Richard last season, and I'm hoping that in season 8 we see more of this internal battle between his desire to be peaceful and his desire to clear. I'll admit that it took me a while to start warming up to Chandler Riggs' TV version of Carl Grimes. In the first couple of seasons of the show, I found him to be a bit of an annoying brat, due to his constant whinging and his tendency to do the exact opposite of what he was told, which as a result often put members of the group in danger. It's only in the last few seasons that I've enjoyed watching him, as he's completed his transition from an irritating boy to a respectable young man. Despite me now being fond of the TV show version of Carl, I liked the comic book version from the very start, due to the fact that I found him to be a lot more engaging and intriguing than the Carl we've seen on TV. I feel that some of the major story changes that took place when moving The Walking Dead to the small screen are behind some of the reasons why I like comic book Carl more. So first off, when Shane and Rick have their final standoff in the comics, 
Unlike the TV show in which Rick stabs Shane and Carl ends up killing his reanimated corpse, Carl instantly instinctively realises that his dad is in danger and shoots Shane through the neck, ultimately killing him. To me, having a young Carl come to his dad's rescue by shooting Shane whilst he was alive always felt more impactful than having Rick kill him and simply having Carl finish him off when he became a walker. A second example I'd like to use is when Carl kills Ben in the comics. For those who don't know, the comic characters Billy and Ben clearly inspired Lizzie and Mika in the TV show, as Ben kills his brother Billy in a similar fashion to how Lizzie kills Mika, leaving Rick's group in a bit of a conundrum as they have to make a decision regarding what to do with the young lad. Whilst everyone is sleeping, Carl decides to take matters into his own hands by sneaking into the van where Ben is sleeping and murdering him. He does this due to his belief that Ben is too dangerous to be kept alive. For a young child to make this choice in order to protect the group, it just goes to show what a complex character Carl really is. Finally, I'm going to use the example of Carl sneaking into Sanctuary and killing some of Negan's soldiers. Although both the comic and TV book versions of the events play out in a very similar fashion, I enjoyed the comic book version more due to the fact that Carl is still a young kid when it happens. Seeing a child sneak into Negan's base with the full intention of killing as many of his men as possible, and with absolutely no regard for his own safety, was absolutely badass. I also loved the fact that Carl was so small he could barely even lift up the machine gun that he decided to use. Contrast this to Chandler's interpretation and it just doesn't feel the same. Unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done about cast members on The Walking Dead aging, however I feel that because of this a lot of what made Carl great in the comics is unfortunately lost. I enjoy the fact that in the comics, Carl appears to be a lot younger when he commits these acts that I've mentioned. To me, there are many times when it appeared that comic book Carl would end up being a real concern for the rest of the group, and could be the future serial killer that Negan described him as. It's this sense of danger and uncertainty that in my mind makes him a more interesting character than the Carl we've been given in the TV show. It really does seem that comic book Carol and TV show Carol are two completely different characters. Apart from sharing the same name and both having a daughter named Sophia, the two have very little else in common. To put it bluntly, comic book Carol is a complete mess. I've already gone into a lot of detail concerning the comic book version of Carol in one of my previous videos, so this time around I'll briefly give you a quick summary of some of the very odd things that she does. Okay, here goes. She kisses Rick when he's with Laurie. She then kisses Laurie herself. She also asks Laurie for a three-way relationship with her and Rick. And finally, she allows herself to be eaten alive by a captured walker. She's completely batshit crazy, and nothing like the Carol that we see on screen. I'm sure that if I had read the comics before I started with the TV show, I would have not for a second imagined Carol turning into a main character, who would still be alive after seven seasons. Carol's transformation from a meek and scared housewife into a walking weapon is one of the best character arcs out of any of the main cast. Yes, she has been a bit of a pain in the arse during the last season and a bit, but there are signs that she will soon be back to her best in the upcoming season. There's so many fantastic Carol moments to pick from the show. My personal favourites include her going full Schwarzenegger and busting Rick and Co out of Terminus, telling Lily to look at the flowers, blending in with the wolves as she stealthily assassinated as many of them as she could, and generally being a scary bitch around poor old Sam. Rick described Carol in season 6 as a force of nature, and that's exactly what she is. Credit is due to the showrunners who have taken one of the weirdest characters from the comics and made her into one of the most likeable in the TV show. What the hell did the TV show do to Andrea? One of the most badass and coolest characters to feature in the comics was essentially turned into the governor's dumb sidekick. I never really cared for Andrea at all during her TV run, and her death at the end of season 3 was one of the most anticlimactic moments to occur in a season finale. It wasn't until I read the comics for the first time that I realised how badly the team behind the TV show had butchered her character. Whereas TV show Andrea seems to be a naive woman drawn to every bad guy on screen, comic Andrea is one of Rick's most dependable soldiers and a crucial member of his team. Her skills with a sniper rifle are unmatched, and many times she has been Rick's trump card when he's found himself cornered. One of the best examples of her amazing abilities with a gun occurred when Rick tracked down the cannibals to the hideout. On Rick's command, Andrea managed to shoot one of the cannibals' ears off and another's finger off, proving to them that Rick wasn't bluffing about having a skilled sniper looking out for them. Although she has sadly recently died in the comics, Andrea was always something of a survivor, managing to overcome any obstacle thrown at her. Well, almost. 
She managed to survive when confronted with the psycho Thomas in the prison, and also managed to fight off Connor when the saviour attempted to kill her while she waited in the watchtower. It was this kind of resilience that caused fans and Rick himself to fall in love with her. They were the ones who live, and although much of her characteristics and comic book scenes have now been stolen by Michonne in the TV show, I would have still preferred to see an Andrea that was closer to the one seen in the comics appear on the show, who would still be alive to help Rick battle Negan in Season 8. The last two characters to feature in this list are both the Walking Dead villains. First up is the Governor, and like the previously mentioned Shane, the Governor suffers from the same problem of not making enough appearances in the comics. All in all, the One-Eyed Madman only appeared in 14 issues of the comics, and in my opinion didn't have enough time to develop as a fully rounded villain. In fact, he was anything but fully rounded, and whilst I do enjoy his comic book arc, he just seemed like a generic psychopath rather than anyone who has any real depth to him. The TV show solved this solution by introducing us to the Governor before he first encountered Rick. Although I just moaned a moment ago about how Andrea was simply used as a means of getting the Governor on screen, this choice did allow the showrunners to let the viewers learn a lot more about his character. By having someone in Woodbury who we already knew, it meant we were able to learn more about him than if he was introduced in a similar manner to in the comics. When the Governor and Rick eventually meet face to face towards the end of Season 3, the encounter felt earned. It wasn't a random chance encounter, like when Rick ran into the Governor in the comics and got his hand chopped off, instead it was a meeting between two leaders who clearly despised one another. The tension was palpable throughout, with both Rick and the Governor trying to get their point across, but ultimately both were too stubborn to give in to the other's demands. Philip's fall from grace was illustrated perfectly over the course of Season 3 and the first half of Season 4. When we first met him, he was an idealistic leader of a community who seemingly had it all going for him. Fast forward to the next season and everything had fallen apart, with the poor old governor stumbling around across the remains of his broken town, dishevelled and defeated. Normally, I'm not really a fan of episodes that focus entirely on one character, but the two episodes that focused on the governor after the fall of Woodbury really allowed the viewer to understand his motives behind his second and final attack on the prison. It also prevailed in showing a more human side to him, as he risked his own life in order to retrieve some oxygen tanks for a dying old man. At one point I genuinely felt there was a chance that the governor could be redeemed, and it's a credit to the showrunners for making him more complex than he may have initially seemed. I do love how crazy the governor is in the comics, but when it comes to who is the better character, the TV version wins hands down. Before I start discussing the final entry on this list, I want to point out that I don't dislike JDM as Negan. Yes, I wasn't fond of him when he was first introduced, but the more time I've spent with him, the more I've enjoyed watching him become arguably the most charismatic character the show has ever had. Despite this, I do still much prefer the comic book version for a number of reasons. Firstly, comic book Negan is a frightening physical specimen. He's a hell of a lot more powerful and intimidating than Rick, and I can believe that he could command a huge army, due to the fact that he could easily beat the crap out of anyone who dared to challenge him. Whilst JDM is by no means a skinny weakling, he just doesn't have the same physical presence. I always imagined Negan to be huge, someone who could easily look down on the much smaller Rick. However, JDM only seems to be a few inches taller than Rick, and to be honest, doesn't appear to be a whole lot more muscular. This may not be something that bothers most people, however it's something that's bugged me since he showed up at the end of Season 6. Secondly, I'm not a fan of Negan's neutered language in the show. I find it weird that on American TV you can show a guy getting his brains bashed in by a baseball bat, but swearing, well that's a no-go. Admittedly, I don't swear much in my videos, but that isn't because I'm anti-swearing. In fact, I swear an awful lot in my everyday life. Instead, I choose not to do so on YouTube because I don't think it really adds anything to the discussion, and I also find it to be a quite a cheap method of trying to get a point across. However, Negan's profanity is ingrained in him. His almost random use of swear words is part of the appeal of his character. It shows how immature and childlike he really is. Seeing him hold back on the cursing, in my opinion, means a big part of what makes him him is ultimately lost. Lastly, the reason I prefer Negan in the comics is because he is the most comic booky character in the entire Walking Dead franchise. I mean, this is a guy who swears every two minutes, is constantly trying to troll others with his cringy attempt at punchlines, and we mustn't forget he also talks to a baseball bat named Lucille. Whilst this all might make sense on paper, seeing it on screen sometimes just doesn't translate well. His dodgy dialogue and mannerisms can just appear dumb, and his constant monologues I've often found to be irritating rather than entertaining. I'm also still at a loss as to how a middle-aged guy who talks to his baseball bat 
has been able to gain the respect of so many people. Maybe it's a bit unfair of me to say this, but when reading the comics I can accept how weird and over the top Negan is, but when watching him do the same thing on TV, it just doesn't feel right. I believe that due to a mixture of the factors I've mentioned, combined with the fact that I encountered the Negan story arc in the comics first before his introduction on the TV show, means that unfortunately for JDM, I'll always prefer the comic book version of Negan over his. So there you have it, my 5 Walking Dead characters who are better on TV, and 5 who aren't. As always, let me know your thoughts below, and thank you very much for watching. Until next time, goodbye.